Netta Spencer, and I am not a science fiction addict. However, some of you may be, and in that case, this is the day for you. Hi. So here are two people who know a lot about AI and especially about killer robots. And we're going to have a conversation for the next little while. Here we have uh, Cesar Jaramillo. Say hi. Hi, Meta. Uh, thanks for having me again. <laughs> and uh, Cesar is the director of Project Plowshares, which I have just termed a a think tank without the the, the wording. The wording we've been using is uh, the Peace Research Institute of the of the Canadian Council of Churches. Perfect. Okay, uh -huh. I like that. It's much nicer than think tank. <laughs> <laughs> and his colleague uh, Branca Marianne. Uh, did I pronounce everything right? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Branca uh, and uh, Cesar have done a couple of things lately that I wanted to share with you. They gave a talk a few weeks ago here in Toronto at the Mars uh, District, I guess they call it, a place where a lot of advanced research is going on, and there's, there's a whole nest of AI experts that work there. And uh, they gave a public uh, talk, which was attended very well by people who were part of those, part of that expert community. And uh, I didn't go to it, so they're going to catch me up. And uh, just after that, they went off to Europe and uh, spent some time in Berlin and then in Geneva dealing with some of the same issues. So there's been a lot going on in their lives in the last few weeks. Thanks so much for having me again, Meta, as well. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Both working on uh, trying to prevent the development and the uh, legalization of the development of killer robots, uh, weapons that are automatic and that make decisions that could actually determine human lives all by themselves <laughs> and that's something that scares most people including right, right. work on them we really wanted to highlight what we find to be concerns with uh, military applications of artificial intelligence and primarily the issue of autonomous weapon systems. So in our view, the incredible concern is with conventional weapons, with growing autonomy, uh, where we see human control diminishing and where human control uh, is maybe not, uh, would or would not be as robust as it should be, right? So, so wait that, a minute, let me, let me make sure I can imagine what you're, talking about here you're going to have conventional weapons like what rifles that shoot themselves or pick their targets or what would be a conventional weapon that is turned into an ai controlled weapon so you have uh, for example uh, there was an announcement from the russian arms maker that they have a tank that can um, uh, autonomously track identify and engage a target um, in um, the in the zone between North Korea and South Korea, you have sentry robots, uh, where essentially the you know at the moment there is someone over there is a human operator overseeing the you know their selection or if they uh, fire, uh, but in you know there's no you know technically it's feasible that this sort of sentry robot could. Uh, shoot. Uh, okay, now I'm fascinated by that. You, you, what are these guys? What do they look like? They look like soldiers marching around. They move, or in in what sense are they sentries? Do they actually uh, pick uh, move around seeking their targets? No. So they're essentially platforms that are in place, but they can move uh, the sort of the the gun on this uh, on them. Uh -huh. So they, they, uh, they don't, um, they're not, you know, maybe you're imagining robots walking around, not at all. They're kind of in the place and uh, sh could, uh, could shoot at a target by themselves, right? Uh, so okay. it's using very basic technology, right? Yeah, and, 
No, no, I, I was going to say, Meta, that, I mean, that's, uh, I think the originating question was some of the, the themes that we addressed at this talk in Toronto. And, and of course, a, a starting theme, a theme or, or topic is, is, is definitional. You know, what, what are these things? You know, what are we yeah. talking about? And also, what are we not talking about? Because, you know, uh, it, it may evoke images of, of drones, which are, you know, are part of the common vernacular these days. It's very common to refer to drones and, and, and it's very easy easy to confuse these with drones or it may evoke some science fiction type images of, of, of humanoid figures uh, you know the Terminator is the obvious reference that, that, that's typically made the Schwarzenegger movie and all these things but in reality there's no predetermined look I mean, the, 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 the thing to get across is the concept of autonomy and meaningful human control or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. That is really what when it's made across. It may look like a, it, it could conceivably may, be made to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger the, intentionally, you know, it could be, <laughs> but, but that's not, there's no reason to believe or expect. It could be large, it could be small, it could be a swarm like the street. Yeah a distributed architecture of little things. But again, I, I would say that it is neither the, the, the shape or the, the, the color or the, you know, that, 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 that defines these things or, or, the, the, or that, that, that relates to our key concern. It is a question of autonomy as it relates to meaningful human control or again, lack thereof. That mm -hmm. is the crucial question, mm -hmm. meaningful human control. And also wanting to impress upon people who attended and uh, at other opportunities and at these, this very conversation with you, Meta, impress the, 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 how groundbreaking that change is or would be, you know, how, mm -hmm. what a huge milestone, what a huge leap uh, from, uh, from ethically, you know, militarily, politically, what a huge leap that, that relinquishing uh, of human, uh, meaningful human control mm -hmm. and being comfortable with it or, or embracing it, normalizing it, become, uh, uh, becoming okay with it. What a huge leap that would be because in all of human history, there has been no such thing. Even with advances, recent advances in, in, in cyber, in, in robotics and in technology with, uh, you know, all of these things, this is a huge leap. And that's why, why it's, it's not, we're very comforted that it is not just us, but that, that is a growing number of very credible scientists, the Elon Musk types, you know, the, 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 the AI researchers, etc., that are, that are, have taken notice of, of how unique and singular a change this would, this would mean and, and, and how unpredictable but dire at the same time the implications would seem to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just the very notion of being pursued by a machine and being the victim of, a, of an intelligent machine that knows what to look right, for. Right, right, right. Uh, that is, uh, you know, something else again. Okay. So I, the systems that I appointed you to are sort of considered to be precursor systems, right? So we already have some instances, and we know that there are about 381 systems in 12 countries that can autonomously track targets, right? So, you know, the, the sort of what we're concerned with is that the technology is fast outpacing the regulation that's happening. So mm -hmm. there have been United Nations discussions since 2014, uh, but they're moving at a quite a slow pace. Whereas we see investments in autonomous systems by different countries um, growing. And so that's where we're really concerned. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, the, you um, uh, tell me, you say you had some people in your audience at the Mars district. Uh, meeting uh, who were themselves professionals in developing AI. Now AI itself, I think it, maybe it's worth talking about the distinction between killer robots and AI because we've got some really good things that can be done with AI and I, I don't know what what to think about it. Uh, right. And I, as I understand it, the Toronto is becoming world center of research on AI both because there's some big shot, a, a man named Hinton, I think you said, yeah. who is uh, one of the fathers of the field. And um, artificial intelligence is what that stands for. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because there's been a new grant from uh, a couple of, uh, a billionaire couple in Canada that's gonna fund a major center for 
artificial research, yes. uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, can, can you uh, tell us what that community is like? What are they, uh, wh how do they feel about what, what's going on? Part of the, the a concrete um, objective that we have is helping to build bridges between different communities that should be interested in, the, in this topic. I mean, arms control topics have, have traditionally been, you know, there's been a bit of a silo situation going on where it's for political scientists and or related fields, that sort of thing. But I think the, the, in, in, the, in the case of killer robots are more broadly autonomous weapons and emerging military technologies, we are seeing really, it, it is a key defining feature is the multiplicity of stakeholders and 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 the fact that from different angles and different perspectives they have they have a clear legitimate stake and, and, and interest in this file so we have we have the traditional policy wonks but you also have industry and 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 people in the tech sector and and you have academics and you have military and that that um, sometimes could lead to to you know people who understand the tech side but not necessarily the governance implications or the policy making processes that are related to that mm -hmm. or vice versa people people who understand the policy and the governance of it but but uh, but who want uh, to 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 produce or aim for evidence based policy making that is that really has the science right and the facts right so i think these communities and uh, and and that has been a, a priority for branca with the, with this program uh, is really the the notion of building bridges and finding common language harmonizing language and uh, and, and, and achieving greater awareness of what the other play in the same in the same area of, of, of interest are, are, are doing well now Branca said something interesting that a lot of the researchers themselves don't want to be doing anything that is uh, you know would shock us in terms of developing weapons and that they are actually coming to you and making link reaching out to you because they want you as a partner as much as you want them right now, what about within the whole AI uh, domain, if that's the word for it, uh, are, is there a cleavage between people who are pro and pro, people who are con? Are the manufacturers mo mostly looking forward to making these ter terrible weapons uh, and the military people looking forward to it and they're on one side versus mm -hmm. the academic researchers or, or other? What is the, what are the, it, it, what's the fault line within the community as to what their position is? I think it's very interesting because it, it, you know, it's perhaps different than people expect it to be. In, for example, in the case of the military, uh, where you know, in sort of consultations and discussions with members of the Canadian Forces, what I've found is that they're quite thoughtful about the use of autonomous systems and autonomy uh, in the battlefield. Uh, they bring their own personal experiences, and they're you know, they really have thought through the implications of these types of systems. So they you know, that that's an interesting, I think, interesting because you don't expect that. Uh, mm -hmm. That you know, you the expectation would be that the military is really enthusiastic and would push for this. Uh, I think there's more enthusiasm perhaps from the defense policy people because it sounds appealing because it could, you know, this type of technology would be a force multiplier um, and all of these sorts of things that they could, um, you know, really highlight. But I, I also find that, like Cesar was saying with, you know, it's just a very dynamic uh, discussion that's happening amongst different groups that aren't always at the same table. So what I do find interesting about the academic researchers and the tech sector is the extent to which they have actually really become engaged and the more they learn about some of these issues and you know, get tools to do um, you know, consultations with the government or engage the public, you know, they really enjoy it and they'd like to share their concerns. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. The, you know, the whole campaign Stop Killer Robots really, uh, you know, resulted from, um, you know, roboticists uh, and tech specialists approaching NGOs and saying, we're concerned about these developments, but we don't know how to speak to these different communities. We don't know how to speak to the policy community. And you have those skills, so you could be an important... Do they, they approach different non-governmental organizations, really? you know, international mm -hmm. non-governmental organizations. And that's really the start of the campaign. And I think it's really indicative 
of what this field is like, that you do have that bridge building happening. And we're, of course, very interested and supportive of this and think this is really important because we do think that people who understand the technology might not necessarily understand the policy world. So we, you know, and people who understand the policy world might not have the skills or the tools that they need uh, to engage in very technical discussions. But when you have these people, uh, you know, at the table sharing their knowledge and sharing their concerns, I think that can create quite an important impact. Mm. Okay, I just had this fantasy. Maybe we can do away with killing people altogether. We'll just have your robot go out on the field and we'll send out our robot and they'll each have a battle and one of them will kill the other one and that'll be the end of the war nobody nobody gets hurt just a bunch right. of robots a pile of and metal at the end <laughs> how do you how do you make sure that that is that is in fact the end of the war yeah. I mean, there's i mean this this is i mean one of the one of the things that, that we have to contend with in, in in the killer robots conversation but generally in arms control file is those arguments you know those counter arguments well, those, people that take have made yeah, yeah. arguments seriously yeah of course yeah no no it's it's not a criticism that you said i'm glad you said it because <laughs> that's what needs to be addressed you know and we and we of course do we, we don't uh, neither minimize nor hide from such questions. We, we, we think these are important, <laughs> important questions that, that, mm -hmm. that need to be addressed. So one such question is th that, you know, if you'd rather, you know, would you rather send your son or daughter to battle or a piece of metal? And, and, and people would, would almost uh, intuitively opt for the latter, you know, the piece of metal because it's not, not, not my son or, or, or daughter. But uh, first, I mean, there, there's a general risk and I'm not the first to say it, you know, but it has been identified as that notion, that line of thinking generally would lead to decreasing the threshold for going to war. I mean, war is a serious thing. It's a major thing. And, and some people need to be reminded it's generally an illegal thing, at least by the United Nations and the Charter, all of, all of those things. Aggression is legal with robots or with humans. I mean, aggression is legal. So that very significant decision, that consequential decision of going to war, may the threshold may be lowered. And there, there, there's other implications to that. And, and, and that's problematic because you're like, yeah, it's just robots. Send them to do, to do the fighting. Uh, secondly, there's no guarantee that the fighting would be contained to, 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 to robots. You know, the, the, maybe they'll come after you next after they've, they've, they've taken down our Canadian robot defenses or something like, yeah. like that meta. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but there's a host of implications related to, to not only to that scenario. That's one narrow hypothetical, I think, based on flawed assumptions scenario. But there's a host of other implications of the emergence of killer robots, including ethical, including that sort of basic question of do we really want to allow machines to make life or death decisions? Like, is that the society we want to live in that, that are not minor and, and are not from peaceniks or anything? It's a fundamental question that I think scientists ask themselves, academics, like, is that where we want to go? And also the this destabilization that they would bring, you know, it would, it would not just be uh, a generic robot. It, it is your robot, and I'm going to to try to outsmart that robot and try to 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 create a better robot, and then the other party, and then that's the the logic of arms races, and then it would be, literally become an artificial intelligence arms race, which is which is uh, problematic in in its own right. And absolutely, the one thing that you know, this is I mentioned this question. Uh, you know, people would and world the World Economic Forum a few years back asked this question as well. You know, would you rather send robots or you know the sons and daughters of your community to fight? And mo you know, eighty percent of people would say robots, right? Which makes sense. But then you flip that question and you ask, you know, would you rather if yourself, if you are in a conflict zone, face a robot or a human soldier? And then the you know responses are the reverse, right? Most people would prefer to uh, face a human soldier. And I think that speaks to this even you know the humanity that is in conflict and involved in wars, and that you know war is a profoundly social uh, activity. And so I think once we introduce the ideas, there's a lot of techno optimism. There's a lot of people who think, well, if we just send the robots to fight, then we could, you know, not deal with sort of uh, the loss of human lives in warfare. But we know that that is not going to be the case. And what we know about trends in warfare 
is also important to recognize, right? We know that we're fighting more wars in urban areas. We know that those trends are only going to increase because we know that most of the world's population is going to be living in urban areas. Hmm. So, you know, the, the idea that you would somehow just have robots fighting robots is not very realistic. Um, and, you know, militaries, you know, what would be the advantage to that? How would you gain an upper hand? And then that's where the questions of what are the implications for ordinary uh, individuals comes into, uh, into play. Right. And, uh, and you mentioned earlier when we were speaking of the different uh, stakeholders, you know, we put it in the terms of building bridges, which mm -hmm. is true and necessary and part of an ongoing process. But I want to clarify, it's not just building bridges for the sake of building bridges. I, I think, I mean, there are concrete benefits to, the, to that bridge building. And it's, uh, you know, uh, one of which is as we wait for regulation that we really want both at the domestic and the, and the international level, strong regulation to prevent some of these scenarios. I think this, 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 converse, this ongoing conversation among different stakeholders may lead to other interim initiatives that they can take on their own, including those related to corporate social responsibility, including those uh, to, related to imposing self uh, limitations on, 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 the, on the types of, of products that industry produces and the types of, of clients or end users that, that are deemed acceptable on the type of research that academic hubs are doing into, into some of these things in the, in the types of, 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 of licenses that are issued by or patents, you know, and, and whether there are restrictions uh, around those and that can go a long way it is at the same time not a substitute for regulation you know for for effective strong domestic and international regulations because at the end of the day even google even the major companies they operate under certain jurisdictions and then and, and that is the, the purpose of regulation to set limits on on on, on what is acceptable because the the Many times, companies, the private sector, they will go, even if they are law compliant, you know, they will tend to go as far as the law allows. Well, so what that, about Google, something like that? What do they want to? Be regulated. Regulated. Google, Google let's say, which is, right. I suppose, one of the main I think, I mean, there's, there's a tendency towards resistance, just, but not just Google, just in general industry to, to, to heavier regulation, but, but they are having a conversation for sure. And there's evidence, and Branca can point to specific examples. They are having a conversation, you know, at artificial intelligence, et cetera. They're also doing cool things with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. like the, uh, the, the, the self-driving car, for example, is, uh, often comes up, which are at least innocuous if, if not benign you know uses and that points to another key argument or counter argument that one hears out there that you know what about the benefit the benefits what about the good things that our official mm -hmm. intelligence can bring and 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 we we're always happy to say keep them you know no one is arguing against mm -hmm. the benefits and we don't want to 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 portray ourselves and certainly the campaign doesn't portray itself as being techno skeptical you know it, it's 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 not that it's it's disaggregating having the wisdom that's why we're you know humans and have policy processes having the wisdom to the discriminate and disaggregate basically to oversimplify a little bit the good from the bad and focus regulation on the latter and actually break mentioned uh, that in your very building in waterloo there there are people working on using uh, robots that will uh, demine uh, minefields. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's beautiful, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's on the earlier point, I just wanna say this. I mean, the interesting thing and that you know, might not be clear to everyone often is that in some cases, it is the tech companies that are asking the government for regulation, right? Uh, so we've certainly seen certain companies such as Facebook really try and, you know, sh kind of shrink back from it being regulated. But, you know, then we've seen Microsoft and Google and others come out and clearly say we do ne need regulation. Now, how, you know, uh, how serious are they about that? How, you know, is another question. But they have certainly been quite vocal in saying that we absolutely need regulations on artificial intelligence yeah. and its application in different spheres. Um, and they've started initiatives amongst themselves. And Microsoft has an initiative on more of like a human rights approach to uh, artificial intelligence. But I, I think that, like Cesar, I want to reiterate Cesar's earlier point that 
you know, these are great initiatives and we need more of them, but they're not enough and are not a substitute regulation. We absolutely need the regulation. The companies are asking for it. Uh, and I think governments have to start delivering on this because that is the best way to ensure if, you, if we really want ethical AI and technology for good and responsible AI, all these, you know, hashtags that are used in social media and often mentioned by tech companies, if we really want that, we need stronger regulation. We need to recognize that there are absolutely new human rights associated with digital technologies that need to be uh, really embedded and that, that this is the best approach, that we can't just rely on, uh, you know, goodwill statements and commitments to some sort of ethical approaches. We really need to see this as a rights-based approach. Absolutely. And by the way, you mentioned Facebook as uh, dragging its feet. In just a, uh, the last week, Mark Zuckerberg has published something saying that he actually wants, is, is asking for government regulation over the content of the uh, filtering and the censorship that they have to exercise. And right. this is hard because I have been in a big fight with fa Facebook for the last uh, six weeks or two months because every time I post a, a video that has any any uh, controversial content, whatever, they tell me I can't boost it or advertise it around in other countries. They think that nowadays- well, what, what are you posting, Meta? <laughs> uh, trees, how to plant trees. They have rejected my uh, video about how to plant trees, wow. for example. Uh, and of course they rejected my thing about how to nu disarm nuclear weapons. They wouldn't allow anything like that to be dis disseminated in the US and so on. So I've been going through this all over the place. And, and, and Zuckerberg said, it's just too hard to decide what is political and therefore has to be forbidden. Right. You don't want people from other countries tampering with your electoral system. Yes, I understand that. But, you know, find out. Just, you know. Right. And, and so, but he's actually calling for regulation and I certainly prefer yeah. it because that way, at least if you're dealing with a government outfit, you have recourse, you have ways of, you know, modes of, of, of uh, influencing the outcome where you uh, regulation is is somehow accountable to the population there's political accountability whereas a a company that's private and simply can say well we don't we don't like what you're saying and we're not going to let you publish it that is no good from my point of view i'm really outraged by that yeah, anyway absolutely. i've, I've deflected our conversation from something but, that relates to ai to although it's not Totally. But actually, I wanted to point that out, that I think there is a, there is a risk, and I mean, not a great risk, but there is a risk of conflation, you know, because, because that's also an interesting conversation, and that's also relevant, and AI also plays a role in, you know, some of, the, some of these algorithms for detecting hate speech, for, you know, and, and, and so AI is present, but just to highlight something that's perhaps obvious, I mean, that the, the at least from from the perspective of, of, of the campaign, there is a, a narrow and intentional focus on the weapons, you know, on the possibility of, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of weaponizing. I mean, there's, I'm sure, legitimate concerns and cases to be made for, for, for you know, hate speech and all of the, you know, all related issues where AI plays a role. But the the focus certainly from a from a campaign perspective is on the weapons themselves. I think the people who are you know like Elon Musk and I, I think Hawking also expressed a concern about the future of AI uh, because I think they are seeing a future really I hope it's very far in the future that when uh, different systems get so smart that they're smarter than human beings and maybe they develop a motivation to do something that's counter to what we would like for them to do. Right. And, and there's no certain way of preventing that, I gather. So can, is, is that really, is that related to what you're doing or are you confining yourself strictly to the question of not, in, not allowing weapons to have the potential to physically injure people? 
But that's that's a related concern, right? The yeah. con the related concern there is that you know if you have algorithms making certain decisions um, and they're engaging with other algorithms, and you know there is no human control over that process, you don't know what could happen, right? So like when we look at the markets, there's these flash crashes that happen all the time, yeah. right? Um, because the in, algorithms interact in unpredictable ways. And so it is this issue of unpredictability, really, that, you know, that is a key concern when you don't have human control. And it relates really to accountability, right? Because our laws of war hold humans accountable. We don't hold, you know, algorithms accountable. So if you can say that something was unpredictable or out of your control, um, then it's not, you know, you will not be able to hold a, you know, a military commander responsible for the actions of a particular weapon system. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that discussion is really, I mean, core, because it does get to the question of, do you understand what a system is doing? Is there, you know, human control and oversight that is meaningful enough to understand what is happening and to ultimately be the key decision maker? Mm -hmm. And if those steps are not in place, then even if you have some form of human oversight over this, it is not sufficient, right? That, yeah. that weapon system would then, you know, really should be prohibited because we do not want, uh, you know, algorithms interacting in unpredictable ways in uh, financial markets, but we certainly do not want them, you know, making mistakes and decisions where, you know, you have human lives at stake. And that's where, and then, and then to sort of top that concern off, then you absolutely have no accountability for those weapon systems. I mean, international, the International Committee of the Red Cross has been quite clear that our existing international humanitarian laws are not sufficient to address these new issues with autonomous weapon systems. And so, you know, the, that's why new law and would provide clarity and of would course. ensure that there is accountability. How would you, Meta. what would these wa uh, laws look like? I'm sorry, Cesar. No, uh, I was gonna say that, uh, that futurist, there's futuristic scenarios, you know, of, of varying credibility or, or, or sophistication and from, from a very sophisticated ones, you know, the, the, to science fiction literature, you know, there's all sorts of, of, of futuristic scenarios and there's, in all of them, there's a degree of speculation, um, I would say. But, but I'm also convinced in terms of, of my own thinking about the future is, is that technology is, is going to astonish you know, in ways that, that even the most optimists, uh, you know, cannot fully grasp or, or predict. I mean, it's going to be, there's an exponential nature to the growth of, the, of, the, of these technological advances. Now, the reason I say this is because the bringing back to governance and regulation is that even with all arms control, with, you know, hardware, with the nukes and the, and the conventional weapons and the small guns and all, all, all of these things, the gap has always been apparent between, between you know, the, between the, the, where, where the, the actual state of affairs and regulatory efforts. There's always, it's always lagging behind reality. It's always lagging behind the, 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 the pace of policymaking. But I think the pace is such, I mean, and the, rapid, the rapidity with which these development, developments are advancing is such that, that policymaking is really noticeably going to be lagging behind unless it's 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 proactive enough and and has the, the sufficient foresight uh audacity i would say to really identify the the gravity of the risk and 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 the and the and the urgency of a, of, a, of an undertaking to to really create a regulatory frame framework before the the before the proverbial you know too late <laughs> scenario happens, and 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 it is unique in that sense that uh, with other categories of arms control and certainly other processes that that we are at Project Cloudshare involved with, they tend to relate to arms or categories of, of systems that have already been used in a hostile manner, have already been used in conflict, including nuclear weapons in Hiroshima, etc. And once they have used, I think efforts are all more complicated you know it's really complicated mm -hmm. so, so I think it's important to identify that that with with these systems the international community has the unique and rare 
opportunity to be proactive, to be actually proactive, mm -hmm. like before it, it, it really gets out of hand. And I would argue that the window is still open, you know, for that proactive, proactive approach, et cetera, um, but only barely open and and and, and that, that situation will not hold in perpetuity and, and and they may well emerge and it may well be too late. Mm -hmm. and, and and so so yeah I think it's I, I would stress that that uh, the 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 critical nature of the of the juncture we find ourselves in in, in in terms of the emergence of these technologies. It's really time is of the essence, not to sound alarmist particularly, but time is of the essence. I and mean, we may really cross a threshold where it gets out of hand and, and then the dynamics of an arms race uh, start kicking in. And, it, and then it creates financial incentives and it's, it's then, you know, then, it, you know, it's all the more hard, uh, very hard to stop. But, but I think if we act now, and that's the difficulty, you know, sort of that, well, impressing upon the general public, policymakers, etc., like, hey, we're not kidding around. This thing could get out of hand, and we may collectively regret it as a, as a, as a, as a species to not have acted sooner. Right. Now let's talk strategy. I mean, you mentioned getting the general public aware. Is that where you want to start, or do you want to simply work with these experts who already are aware of the threat and maybe... Uh, you know, among yourselves, you can agree this is just not the way we're going to go. So give me a rundown on what went on there. Uh, if you can, in, in Berlin, that was the meeting of the campaign to stop yes. other robots. Tell me about it. So there are about a uh, hundred organizations in uh, over 50 countries around the world that have joined the campaign Stop Killer Robots, which essentially the goal is to have the sort of uh, a prohibition of these weapons before they're created. Um, and what was interesting in Berlin is how diverse the group is, the, you know, the different regional, there's the regional focuses, the regional activities that are happening in outreach there. Um, there are, you know, thoughts about, uh, you know, ethical concerns, uh, legal, moral, technical, looking at, you know, a gendered lens. So it was really a comprehensive, um, you know, look at the issue of autonomous weapon systems and then thoughts about how do we move forward and how do we address what, you know, we've identified as being crucial, which is uh, an awareness gap for most people. Uh, on this issue for and um, a lot of that was uh, sort of propelled and uh, there was a great deal of enthusiasm because there was a poll that was conducted which showed that you know over 60 percent of the population around the world is really against the development of autonomous weapon systems um, so there you know there's public outreach there's engagement of the experts and tech communities and so sort of when you started off Meta, i wanted to comment you know what we really need and what we are doing and what we're seeing is a multi-layered approach right we need to have uh, the focus on public outreach we need to do consultations with the government and with the you know different departments of national defense we need to engage in forums such as the one that you know we attended in geneva which is the convention on certain conventional weapons where the discussions have been happening since 2014 and so in 2016 there has been a group of governmental experts um, and we do you know certainly need all of these communities and all of this support let me halt you you mentioned a group of government governmental experts that sounds like a u.n outfit right that's the word they use yes, yeah, yeah, the United Nations. yeah so what is this thing because did the u.n uh create a committee of uh, governmental experts to work on this and and uh Yes. Well, the, uh, from a multilateral policy perspective, the body that has been working on this issue is uh, the CCW in Geneva, which is a convention on certain conventional weapons. And it was in this context that a DD, a, a group of governmental experts, was was established to to to, to look into more detail uh, on some of these issues. That relates to the you asked, uh, you know, whether uh, about strategy that I think it's, it's a multi-pronged strategy. First of all, I mean, that relates to one level of engagement with, you know, policymakers and trying to push uh, from a civil society perspective, trying to push for, for greater work, greater attention, great, uh, a faster pace of work of, of these issues, concrete deliverables, etc. 
but there's also public opinion and the general public, and there's a huge awareness gap around this issue, uh, where, whereby, you know, it seemed to either be too far down the future, like, eh, should we ever start worrying about this now, when it's really, you know, right around the corner, the proverbial corner, or it seemed to be too sci-fi, you know, like in the, in the, it's not a real thing that could actually happen. I mean, you as Project Plowshares must have some campaign. You just showed me you had a brochure there. Why don't you, this is a good time to... And thanks. I mean, there is a quick explanation, but if, if you can bear with me, I'll read the questions sure. and then just to show you because we were intentional about sort of employing somewhat straightforward colloquial language because and, and avoiding jargony things so people get it that more or less that it's a thing so the first question is what are killer robots two aren't drones the same thing sort of trying to preemptively preemptively address one of the common misconceptions that it's just drones um, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, the a key distinction, there are several, but a key distinction is that uh, uh, with drones, there is still human involvement, and uh, whereas, whereas with autonomous wa weapons, there would not be. Yeah, there's somebody in Arizona <clears throat> pulling the trigger that's going to kill somebody in Afghanistan, right? <laughs> yes, in an air conditioning room in Arizona, you know, like a Nintendo joystick uh, sort of situation. Uh, three, do killer robots actually exist? Four, what can be done to prevent their development? Five, should only states be concerned? Six, is there a diplomatic forum addressing this issue? Seven, is there support for a ban? Eight, why campaign when there is already the CCW? Nine, what about the benefits of artificial intelligence? And 10, isn't the call for a ban premature? So trying to address sort of the, the misconceptions, the counter arguments, the, the, the basic definitional issues, like a primer sort of. A, People find it impermeable, right? They think that, you know, like, how, what is it that I can do? How can, like, I maybe don't understand the technology. And so this is one of the reasons for this more colloquial kind of approach is for people to understand that they absolutely can understand the issue. They have a stake. Um, and there is knowledge and resources out there. And there are these groups uh, around the world, really, who are working on these issues. Uh, how, how can people get your thing? I imagine you have it online. Why don't yes. you let's see, it, URL or how, how do they get it? Well, the, the easy right now it's it's uh, plowshares.ca. It's our, uh, on our homepage. And because it is a recent one, it's still featured like on the homepage. After this call, I will, Branka, I will send you the link, the direct link, and then, then you can help us get it out okay. there. Okay, Plowshares, you've got to spell it with P-L-O-U-G-H-S-H-A-R-E-S dot C-A. Is that yes. all you say? Yes, yes, that is correct, yes. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, so in Berlin, how uh, uh, am I right in assuming that, well, I don't know how big the meeting was, but, uh, but that most of the people there were NGOs like yourself? Or yes. who were the other participants in this campaign against killer robots? Yeah, there. So the campaign itself is actually quite diverse. Uh, so there are non-governmental organizations like ourselves that are involved, but there are also uh, tech specialists, researchers, you know, technologists sort of at large, uh, AI experts uh, that are part of it as well. Um, and there's there were also other sort of interested researchers from universities, so universities, so academics, um, civil society, um, you know, technologists, and so it's really interesting because it is a quite a dynamic group, um, which sort of is representative of the different concerns with, you know, different concerns with the issue of autonomous weapons. So you have ethicists, you know, and you have lawyers, and you have technologists, and you have human rights organizations. And I think it's a reflection of, of, of a broader interest in the file, broader, despite the, the fact that I just said, you know, there is an awareness gap, and, and there is, in fact, an awareness gap. There's also, you know, that we're trying to reverse that trend, and, and there seems to be some mm -hmm. growing interest and support for, for, for this, and, and I think it's a recognition of the, of the scary nature of, of the prospects of what could be, really. Yeah. How long did this thing in, in Berlin last and how long were you there? Uh, um, we were there for, no, it was a two day, uh, basically a two or three day. Yeah, it was a three day, day, a three day event in Berlin uh, with uh, an opening evening, a very, very um, 
exciting, energetic, sort of different actors, different players in the campaign, uh, giving a, uh, the, you know the reasons why this is important and when they are engaged, why they are engaged in it. This included, uh, um, you know, various, not to name every one of them, but the, it included Jody Williams, who's 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 uh, who's uh, the co-recipient of the of the Nobel Peace Prize for, for with the with the International Campaign to Land Mines, and is now in supporting the efforts of the of the campaign to stop killer robots. And Mary Wareham from Human Rights Watch, who's uh, who's uh, coordinating the campaign, and and, and organizations like. Like ours, like Project Plowshares, some, some larger like Amnesty, some smaller, you know, like ours. But, uh, but in general, very good positive energy uh, around the event. A very clear recognition of the, of the of the risks involved. Uh, uh, a bit of disillusion about the the pace of progress at, at these forums like the CCW that we would we would we would hope would be would be acting at a faster pace and with with greater um, yeah our recognition of the of the gravity of the thing and resolve and there's questions even about the effectiveness of this forum and and, and the appetite that there may be for for a legally binding uh, uh, policy. This, the convention, certain convention, uh, examines weapons that would be excessively sort of damaging or cause exa excessive damage to the population, <coughs> essentially. Um, and it's a consensus-based body, so the countries have to agree to whatever comes out of it. Um, and it's in the past been successful in banning, for example, lasers and blinding lasers. Um, there's some work there on cluster munitions as well, and then it was sort of taken out of that particular forum. Um, and so, you know, this the reason why autonomous weapons were brought into this, this particular forum is because it's seen sort of by some countries or quite a lot of countries to be the, you know, the relevant forum for this discussion because these would be weapons that would cause excessive uh, damage if there was no human control. Okay, I can, I can see the rationale now because the notion, I think it's called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. And AI yes, I, 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 will, I, I just happen to have the full name in front of me, which is not easy to remember, but it's a, well, for sure the CCW, but it's the United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which may be deemed to be excessively injurious or to have indiscriminate effects. Uh huh. Okay. So that's just, the, the term conventional weapons itself was kind of a contradiction in terms because these are anything but con conventional. Yes. And yet <laughs> they, they qualify because they're not nuclear, chemical, or biological. Is yes. that yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, I think it, we should be alarmed when these things become actually conventional. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So this thing, this uh, convention has existed a long time, presumably. Uh, yes. Where and when did that... I mean, how much longer is it, would it be convenient for the file to stay at the CCW if it doesn't yield any concrete results? Oh. And if not... And if not in the and, and it's not that it's civil society's you know prerogative or authority to to make those determinations like we can try to to make the case but the, you know it's still a state centric forum but but also the related question if not the CCW what would be the alternative would it be an ad hoc process would it be uh, trying to put, take it to the general assembly would it you know and and, and there and and it, it all depends to a certain extent on 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 states what do you favor in terms of it, it you think it might be desirable to begin um moving it to a more autonomous kind of uh, process right um so it, um but the problem like cesar was saying with the way the consensus form works is that uh, quite a few of the advanced uh, militaries are, you know, pushing back against regulation and really watering down any kind of agreement that exists in the room. Um, but I think from the CCW perspective, from the, it's, you know, the, their perspective as well, they haven't really come up with any kind of new regulation, you know, for a long time since, two, you know, 2006 where the explosive remnants of war, you know, were looked at. So I, you know, so there's really, I think it would be in the interest of this particular uh, forum to 
have some form of new regulation developed. I mean, it's, it clearly speaks to their mandate uh, looking at, you know, excessive uh, sort of, in, in, you know, damage and uh, indiscriminate weaponry. So I think from that perspective, it, you, know, you know, it could be the form, but uh, other forms might be, you know, much more nimble, much more, you know, much more flexible and easier for countries to push the for uh, process forward, even when, as in other processes, sort of the major powers really prevent uh, any kind of regulation, right? Because I think the interesting thing on this issue in that room at CCW is the vast majority of countries that have spoken up in, during, you know, the years that I've participate and watch this process unfold since 2016 all agreed that there should be human control and you know okay, and there should be human control everybody would agree also there should be nuclear weapons uh banned but when yeah. you have a system that is a consensus-based model for decision making uh, any one country that seems to think they would like to keep their weapons and the edge that they have over other com countries, yeah. they have a chance to b b uh, veto any, any progress. And maybe instead yeah. of looking at setting up a different body uh, other than the place you've been meeting, maybe the focus ought to shift to mm, how are we going to get rid of that stupid consensus decision-making model? Why not have take a vote or put? I don't know what has to be done. Yeah, to that into a I mean, I think that I mean those are all valid points, uh, and I think something to note is that it's it's easy, and often with good reason, but it's easy to blame the forum and to blame the rules of procedure, and and I do believe they have an impact, and I do believe there is very concrete pros and cons to certain forums versus others. But it's also important to remember that it's, it's, it's the actors also, you know, ultimately the key obstacle, I think it's, it's more than the forum is the position of the United States or, or country X or B or C and, uh, uh, and, and, and whether or not they're ready politically to make progress on a certain file and, and, and the position of a certain country will likely not change significantly if it's the General Assembly or the or the or the or the Conference on Disarmament or the CCW or any other body. Uh, so so yeah, just important to remember both sides. Yeah, the the, the the process, the body, the venue, the rules around it are are of course significant. But it's also the political will, the you know, good old political will and readiness to engage on the issue and 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 and, and that sort of thing, which does it, which is not contingent upon the specific forum. So I think in, 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 in terms of engaging these states, the challenge, not just civil society, but also from other states, there's lots of progressive states that also are concerned, just as concerned as civil society about these developments, is to, to make the case ultimately that, 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 that for states that may be on the fence or, or opposing or wanting to keep these, these weapons for to have a, a military edge, to make the case ever strongly that regulation banning fully autonomous weapons, etc., would not be tantamount to a concession on national security grounds. That's quite the opposite, that it's actually in their benefit, in their collective interest, not just of the others, but of, of themselves, of their own security interest, national security interest, mm -hmm. to do so. Because otherwise, if they if it is perceived to be a concession, and the same applies to nuclear weapons, which I know you also follow, Meta, uh, if it's if it's if it's seen to be a concession on security grounds, it will never happen. That's right. So 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 that paradigm needs need to be shifted. It's like, dude, it's for it's for your own good. <laughs> you're not, like you're not giving up the you know it's for your own good, and really that's 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 the gist of it. And and with that, I will I will because I really do have another commitment. I will thank you, Meta and Branka, very much for the thank you. for the wonderful conversation. Yeah. Okay. And um, and sign off. And okay. and you can you can continue till uh, a few more hours, I think. We're, we're <laughs> I've got to wind it up too. I think we've got <laughs> to use up our hour. And, uh, thank you so much, Cesar, and uh, bless you for what you're doing and keep it up. Okay, no, I'm lucky to work with wonderful people like Branca and, and, and connect with wonderful people like you, so that's amazing. All right, okay. see you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Fra Branca, I want to ask you one more question in particular, which is 
which are the countries that are your opponents in this? We have the usual suspects, right? We have the you know, United States and Russia really pushing back. Uh, but we also have you know, the UK, which is in a bit of a you know, problematic position where it wants to present itself as uh, being constructive, but really it seems to be at the same time investing a great deal of money in autonomous weapons and running, uh, in, sorry, in autonomous systems and running a series of autonomous warrior exercises, like big robotics uh, exercises. So we have those countries and we have surprising countries like Australia, which are, you know, also really pro, um, you know, these types of autonomous systems and which I really are. I understand Australia. They seem so completely screwed up. Lately. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know what's happening with Australia because the comments that they're presenting, you know, are really full of techno optimism. I'm talking, you know, along with the United States talking about maybe the benefits of these weapon systems and things like this, which, you know, most experts have really uh, kind of disregarded. And uh, then we have countries like Canada, which are really not speaking up in these forums. I mean, Canada has been really silent, uh, has been surprisingly um, and ambitious and has not, uh, you know, raised concerns that you would expect Canada to raise. We haven't heard about, you know, humanitarian implications. We haven't heard about, um, you know, what this would mean for warfare. We haven't heard those types of statements from Canada. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, and surprisingly, at the last meeting, uh, Canada also came out with a statement saying uh, that Canada is interested in and in, uh, investing in research in advanced, uh, sorry, sorry, in autonomous systems. Uh, we have countries like Germany and France that are proposing political, proposing political declarations. Um, so, th you know, they see this uh, sort of as an interim step. Maybe down the road we would need a legally binding instrument, a treaty. But they think at the moment what we should have is sort of government sign on to a political declaration. And the issue with that is, you know, countries are not going to sign on to something that they haven't really negotiated word by word. So if you're doing all this work, why not go for the strongest, uh, you know, instrument possible? Why not go for a legally binding instrument? Um, and the, you know, then we have supporters. We have countries like China, which have, uh, so, you know, stated that they do not want to see the development of these autonomous weapon systems for uh, offensive purposes. But, you know, it's unclear where China actually is on this issue. But, but I think it's important because it does show willingness. I, I think Russia has really pushed back against the idea of regulation quite strongly. Um, and, you know, they think that existing laws cover everything and that there's sort of no need to address this in a new type of uh, legally binding. Certainly they would be against uh, any kind of legally binding instrument. Uh, so, yeah, you have the usual suspects that are pushing the process. But I think that, you know, there's a vast majority of, you know, diplomats sitting in that room who are really thinking about the implications of Mm -hmm. these new types of weapon systems for warfare and what it would mean for their countries and their populations. And the developing countries have been really, um, you know, thoughtful about this, have spoken up several times, highlight, you know, quite asking, where do these, some of these advanced militaries see these weapons being used? Um, they probably don't see them being used in their own country, so they're going to be used in countries like ours. Like, we're not seeing armed drones, you know, being used in Western countries. We're seeing them used in places like Afghanistan and Yemen and, you know, uh, Somalia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, you know, the question is, you know, are we in the West just a little bit removed from some of that kind of remote warfare? And how do we then... Um, you know, how do we make policies about that? This is this project is Project Save the World, mm -hmm. and we have this platform for survival, which is a, attempting to address six different global threats. And one of the planks on the platform has to do with uh, prohibiting uh, lethal autonomous weapons, yes. uh, which are what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. let's put that on our website along with the wiki that we, we're developing for people who want to understand a little bit more about what's involved. If you'll send that to us. And then I think if you want to share this uh, video with all of the people who on your mailing list or um, any place else that would be of use to people, maybe other members of, uh, 
of the campaign in uh, in Europe who might want to disseminate the video, please do. You you haven't won yet. <laughs> this no, 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 not won no. by a long shot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but we're working on it. <laughs> we're trying. All right, bless you. Right. Thanks fun. so much, Meta. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank bye. You. bye bye. Bye. This conversation is one of the weekly series, Talk About Saving the World, produced by Peace Magazine and Project Save the World. Please visit our website at tosavetheworld.ca, where you can sign the Platform for Survival, a list of 25 public policy proposals that, if enacted, would greatly reduce the risk of six global threats to humankind. Come back next week for another discussion of a serious global issue.